having already interviewed him for my Spain book about their amazing trophy treble, Thomas Hitzelsperger is somebody that I'd desperately wanted to sit down and talk football to on the big interview for ages. Intelligent, articulate and passionate about this game that we love, Thomas is all of that and much more. In fact, I'll be frank and say that for the three of us when we were recording with him in London, even given how much respect we had for him, it was something of a shock about the degree of articulacy and clear, deep thinking about football he's got now that he's an analyst rather than the player. It was stunning to listen to, refreshing and great, great fun. In this part one of our conversation, he breaks down his 11 years at the Bayern Munich Academy, where amongst others, he emerged through alongside Philip Lamb. The courage and daring of Thomas's decision to quit that club age 17 will amaze you. Villa fans, listen closely. I'll bet all of you thrilled to having the hammer at Villa Park will probably be still surprised at exactly what cojones he showed in order to move from Bavaria to the English Midlands and become a star for Villa. We also touch on his part in Stuttgart's Bundesliga title win in 2007. Hitz talks us through his decisive goal on the final day of that thrilling season, a stunning volley. Do yourself a favour, search for it in YouTube right now. Thomas Hitzelsberger, Stuttgart, Bundesliga title. This is part one. I'd say enjoy, but I know you will. Thomas, you enormously helped me and Backpage when we were writing the book about Spain and, and their era, so it's really good to meet finally. First thing I want to say is like, there are golfers who aren't like Arnold Palmer with a swing that comes all over the place and they just hit the ball and it flies and they don't even feel hitting the ball and it's sweet and you can hear angels sing. Now, go left foot. Sometimes your right foot is a little bit like that. At what stage in your life did angels sing to you when you put your left foot in contact with the football and you went, oh, look, I've got a superpower. What just happened there? Or was it all hard work and sweat and practice? A bit of both, really. Right from the start, when I first kicked a football and it went further than most of my mates, I realised this is a quality that I have and I have to cherish it and I have to make sure I keep it and become even better at it. Because we know in football, I mean, back in the days when I was like five or six years old, I didn't realise I would become a professional football player one day. But uh, as a football player, I think it always helps to have one quality that stands out mm. and of course having a really powerful left foot that's how I stood out and I just made sure that I would become even better hitting the ball harder being more precise so I just kept practicing but of course I realized early on this is a quality that I have and uh, not many others have. Then take us to rural Bavaria literally walk us through it where did you do this practice before somebody helped teach you before somebody spotted you and brought you into a system? Well, I was quite lucky the way I was brought up, you know, I've got five older brothers that always played with me when I wanted to play. Grew up on a farm, there's a lot of land, you know, just outside of the house, it's almost like a proper football field. I made sure when I was eight years old, because I, I signed for Bayern when I was seven, and because I had so much space at home, we asked them after a couple of years whether they have some goals for us that we can put on, on, the, on the grass on the field. And that's what they did. We picked those goals up, and I think it started from nine or ten years. We had those two goals outside of our house, so I could always play football. Somebody wasn't a goal, and I took shots, and we played football. I just love football, you know, just like you talk about it now. It, it's so much fun, and back in the days, I just couldn't play enough football. I had training mm. two, three times a week. When I went back home, I played football. And to have that luxury of having a proper football field at home with two goals, what more can you ask for? When you do that on a farm and you're gifted goals, what was it? You said it was like a pitch. What was the surface like? Pretty good. I, I made... it, was, it wasn't bumpy. No, it wasn't like a, a Wembley pitch, you know, but it was good enough. You know, it was better than most other football pitches that you get. And uh, I just made sure, I told my dad, you're going to make sure it's, it's well cut, you know, you cut the lawn every other week so I can play decent football. Because he would sit there sometimes watch me play and of course he realised I, I was a big talent and he wanted to support me all the way through and he did and part of it was cutting the lawn. Were the brothers supportive and full of admiration for this talent or did they sort of push you about and boot you a little bit? Uh, no, they were really supportive. I mean, almost all of them played football. My oldest brother, he was, he was a decent footballer. He played in the fourth division at some point. And uh, they as well, they could spot that I'm, I'm highly talented. And, mm. and 
I had that dream of becoming a football player, a professional football player, and that's why they were always there for me. They would um, take me to training and, and watch training and take me back, and somebody had to help out on the farm at home. So there was always somebody there to help me and make sure that I have the best possible way to train, play, and become that football player one day that I did eventually become. I think you've touched on something, because even when you've got the gift of a terrific natural talent, it isn't simply honing that talent. There's a lot of blood, sweat and tears and hours in cars and dedication from people around you in order to let you even begin to realise the dream, never mind get to where you got to. People need to sacrifice themselves for you. Absolutely. The good thing is I've almost always enjoyed it, you know, training, because when I signed for Bayern Munich at the age of seven, you're always surrounded by good players and, and they all have that dream of, you know, playing for the first team one day. So the support was there, but it's a big competition, you know, when you when you play for such a big team, every time you play, the, the, the teams you play against, everybody wants to be Bayern Munich. So it's kind of in you that you have to work so hard and, and in training you have to compete with the best players in your age group mm -hmm. even in, in, in the entire country and that was a motivation and, and like I said most of the time I was highly motivated I enjoyed it but there was spells when I thought am I going to go all the way through to the top and I have to make a lot of sacrifices and there's times when you just don't enjoy going to training but I would say I was, I was really disciplined and uh, my parents they made sure that I just stick to it and, and those spells when I just didn't enjoy it as much they said you just have to work through it. and they taught me that discipline and, and my, my siblings as well they were there for me and I just felt like I have a responsibility you know with all the support that I get from the family I don't mm -hmm. want to let them down mm -hmm. I have to give my best every day and and that's what I did but for the majority of times I've hugely enjoyed it. If I put the puzzle together I can hear that you felt like I've got something here and get you loved the process of training or winning or beating somebody or scoring a goal what a beautiful pass age seven eight but, but the big dream is, I presume you weren't an 1860 fan, I, pre I presume was. you were 1860. I was, the entire family, 1860, absolutely. God, I'm glad I, I'm glad I asked the question rather than just presume <laughs> yeah, any, well, any further. It's, oh, life must have been shit. Well, obviously my family, they realise, you know, when you get a phone call from Bayern Munich as a kid, you know, they're the best club in, in the country, even though the family's 1860 supporters. My first game was 1860, not Bayern, yeah. uh, as a fan. And, but we were sensible enough to say, well, I've <laughs> got to go there. You know, they're the best club in the country. And if they give you the education that you need, then you go there. And of course, I love Bayern Munich from that day on. And I thought, you know, I have this dream here. Yeah, I'm at that, the best club. That's a very nice phrase, <laughs> but hold on a second. You're in the big interview now. <laughs> so I, I, I live with Arbaloa um, at the end of last season was saying, it's been an honour to wear this shirt. It's just... Told me through the first time at training, somebody hands you a Bayern Munich strip and you're going, yeah, okay, yeah. Well, I was too young. You see, if, if that had happened at the age of 16, 17 or something, it would have been more difficult, you know. But at the age of seven, although you know the family, they're, they're all blues and I talk about 18, 16 and everything, but at seven, you don't have much experience. You Okay, you play for a huge club and you think, yeah, that's, that's a dream. You know, it, it feels different. You're part of this great club. And then you put on the shirt and there's no history with other clubs. So it wasn't difficult for me to kind okay. of readjust myself and say, well, this is my new team. I'm a Bayern Munich player. I'm a Bayern Munich fan. And of course, I went to see all the home games and I admired all the, the players in the Bayern Munich team so for 11 years. this is the Olympic years. Stadium, right? Olympic Stadium. Who, who are we talking about? Are we talking about Maga? Are we talking about Hitzfeld? That was before then. Uh, Otto Rehagel at the time, I think, was there. Yeah. Uh, Giovanni Trapattoni. Um, some big managers, players, a lot of Matthias here. Yeah. story, won't he? Yeah, yeah. So you're watching a trap, banging his shoe on the table, yeah. calling out Struntz and Basler. Yeah. In that era, you're coming into the system uh -huh. and later you and Trap will work together. What kind of Bayern Munich was it then compared to now, do you think? Well, it was, uh, like I said before, the best club in the country, but it wasn't as consistent as it is now, you know, having won the Bundesliga just for the fourth time in a row. Back then, they had fantastic players, but it was also a time when they brought in foreign players for a lot of money. And that's when I felt as an as a academy player, it's becoming increasingly difficult to get into the first team. They were labelled the FC Hollywood at the time, yeah. because of what you just said uh, with Trapp, you know, his famous speech there. Sometimes they won the Bundesliga, the next year they would finish fifth or sixth. And it was just that time, you know, you had uh, interesting players and managers, but they weren't as consistent. The fan base was always there. And it was, it was still a huge club and they would play in, in the, the Champions League and everything, but nowhere near as good as they are now. I'm really, really interested when you see an academy player. Who was your principal character that, that, that guided you, taught you? And what was drummed into you? What were the values that were drummed into you? 
Well, of course, you always realise playing in a game how big the club is because everybody wanted to beat you and the way that people looked at the club. So that was one part that not everybody liked you playing mm. for Bayern Munich. Mm. Uh, of course, the huge fan base, but at the same time, a lot of people hate the club. That was one thing, but also looking up to players like Lotte Mateus, for example. You know, they were the players, the 1990 team that won the World Cup. Uh, there's some Bayern players in there, but Lotte Mateus, for example, he's just stood out. And, and now I know because I've played with players, I played with him, and I say he was just the best player that you could imagine. And um, I, I could watch him in training occasionally, but the problem was, unlike in England, there's no bond between the young players, the academy players and the first team. So this was like a dream. He, he couldn't really think, well, it's not far. There was a fence. After a while, they, they put a fence around the training pitch. So it made it clear, you know, those are the first team players and you're the academy players. There's nothing in between. And my experience was coming to England, you would even have lunch with the first team players. You know, you're an under-19 player or reserve team player. You sit down with the first team players at Bayern. There was no contact whatsoever. You could watch them train, but don't talk to them. You know, they just never wanted to bring the young players and the, the, the first team players together. In every sense, that's just sort of prehistoric in a psychological sense, as well as just visual iconography. Anytime you talk about barriers, yeah. there is no pathway. We don't expect you to... or pretty prehistoric <laughs> here's this 17 foot fence that you've got to you've got to climb yeah. in order to, that just seems to me incomprehensible absolutely and, and I mean that has changed now but also when one of those young players made the step into the first team I know those stories you know I talked to one of them who made as, as, a, as a youngster training with the first team like these players the major work hard for the place you know they, they would kick you in training yeah. you know they, they wouldn't say oh this is a great talent let's have him in the team he can help us having some success no they just want to keep their place and they tried ever so hard to kick you out and if you stood your ground if you you know stood up to the challenge then of course they accepted you but it was it was tough and nowadays you know you're a young kid you got some skill and and whatnot, the manager will bring you in and all the players welcome you and they hope that you can make them a better team. Whereas back in the days, I'd say 15, 20 years ago, they didn't want you there as a young player, that's for sure. Just who made it from your era? And, and I guess, was Lamb sort of two and a half seasons behind you in the academy? or uh, A year like behind me, yeah. Only we hardly ever played together at Bayern. So, I mean, obviously I know him pretty well. I uh, yeah. played with him at the national team. But um, he had to go on loan, first of all. He was in Stuttgart. And that was sort of the time when it, it just shifted a little bit, when they realised we need these young players because they brought in a lot of foreigners and they spent money for them and it didn't quite work, you know, because bringing a guy from, I remember Adolfo Valencia, for example, bringing him in for a lot of money, it's a completely different culture. And if you don't integrate them, mm -hmm. if they don't integrate, don't uh, speak the language, and then some Brazilians, Massini, I remember, he played there as well. And then I thought, well, this is pretty expensive. So we might as well just spend money in, in our academy and bring it through these young players. And I would say Owen Hargreaves was the first one, even though he came from Canada mm -hmm. at the age of 15, I think. And uh, But he played by an academy, and then he went all the way through into the first team. Philip Lahm was another one. But there was also a generation, I think, uh, Trapp actually got them into the first team. That was uh, Didi Haman, Markus Babel, Dietmar Frey, Markus Munch. They were a very good generation and, and four or five of them made it into the first team. But that was kind of the only time when I was at Bayern that you know, young players were promoted into the first team. Before and after, they just preferred to buy players from abroad. Before I ask you the, the slightly more painful one, uh, can I go back again about as soon as you go into an organised, theoretically well-run, well-coached academy, never mind the connection with the first team, what, what did they do? Did, did they concentrate on the parts of your game that they wanted to improve? Or did they look at our left foot and say, this will be your, your very special talent and, and therefore let's maximise that in, in how you pass, how you shoot? Did they give you free kick drills? Just describe the process of helping to refine your skill set at that age? Well, the, the good thing was, and as I described earlier, you're part of a team of individuals who all want to all have that dream of becoming professional football players. So the manager didn't have to tell us to do extra training. He would even have to say, listen, guys, just relax a little bit. You know, we've done our team training. Now you've been out there after training for another half an hour practicing free kicks. Let's just go in, mm. you know, just rest. And that was fantastic because you are amongst other, you know, 15, 16 year olds who all have the same dream and think like I want to work so hard I want to be that one yeah, because we've been told you know there's only one or two of you mm -hmm. 
will make it to the top when you mm -hmm. think, like, I want to be that one. Mm -hmm. And that requires more training, hard, working harder. So they didn't have to motivate me and say, you know, just do some extra drills. What we did most of the time, obviously, work as a team. Tactics became more important, playing in different formations. So at the time, Bayern played in a 4-3-3 formation. So that was required some time for us to learn, how, you know, in different situ uh, uh, positions, how do you play? All right, you start as a winger on the left and sometimes you've been pulled in as number 10 or number 6. So you learn in different areas in the field how to play there. And as kids, obviously, you know, you learn quick, but playing in different areas of the field, you have to learn. And, and that's why tactics was, was more what we did and, and the passing drills, because you have to practice all the time. How did they handle saying to you, look, it's not going to happen? Or, or what did they do? You know, we, we've talked in this series to many, many people. For An, an example is Frank McAvenny. He turned out to be a very, very talented goal scorer, um, extremely successful at West Ham with Scotland and Celtic. And there was a particular manager who said to him, in a very offhand way, you're no good. It was the manager who had given him his opportunity. He said, you're not going to make it, so you're no good. And Frank, it was done in such an offhand way that Frank was in the bath, in the team bath. He just sort of ducked his head under the water, wouldn't listen to him. While he was under the water, as he explained to us, he went, prove him not. And, and he did. But I presume there's a process at the academy in Bayern in those years where they, they call you saying, manager's desk, we've got something, what happened? Well, I, I can say fortunately that never happened to me before they told me, you know, it's about time for me to leave, I left. Because I was there for 11 years and I was always part of a, a smaller group that was really talented and, you know, I, I could see players come and go. I was there from the age of seven. Mm -hmm. Every year, two or three players dropped out, mm -hmm. new players came in. Mm -hmm. And of course, my motivation was like, I don't want to be told to be that one and who's not good enough anymore. So of course, I was good enough every year and I was promoted to the next team. And then, like I said before, they told me I wasn't good enough anymore. I had an offer from Aston Villa. You know, it happened through an agent. I went to the Under-17 World Cup in New Zealand. An agent uh, talked to me and he handed out his business cards and said, well, if you guys are interested in a trial in England, I'm pretty well connected. And I thought, yeah, that's interesting because I've been there at Bayern for quite a long time and I'm just part of the club, but no indication that I would eventually go into the first team. And I wanted to play first team football. And suddenly, you know, you, you meet this guy who says, well, I can get into the Premier League. And I'm thinking, well, why not take a risk there and, and go there for a trial? And that's what I did. Didn't tell the club. Didn't even tell my parents. I thought, I just, this is a maybe once, once in a lifetime opportunity. And um, like I said, I didn't tell anyone uh, apart from my brother. He helped me organise it. And then uh, got on the plane and, and showed up in Birmingham at the Aston Villa training ground on a Monday morning and trained with them for a week. And then um, they were so happy and offered me a contract. That's one of the most astonishing things I've ever heard <laughs> in a series of interviews where we've been told some pretty astonishing things. Uh, you got big cojones because, number one, saying, I tell you what, rather than Stuttgart or Leverkusen or... 18 still want me because I'm red. Yeah. <laughs> My dad, you know, each year he told me, like, why don't you want to go and play for 18 I said, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Bayern is still, you know, much better than 18 60. But and I was surprised, you know, I got surprised myself for that move. Up until then, you know, I was the kind of guy who would go into training every day, try his best, listen to what the manager had to say, and try to do to his best of his ability. And there comes an opportunity, you know, so far away from home, like I said, in New Zealand, the agent is telling me, this is an opportunity, I can help you. And I think, yeah. I should do this. So for the first time in my life, I thought, I'm going to take a risk here. Because after three or four days, Bayern found out. I, I told my manager at Bayern... The, this the, is why the, you're the, in Birmingham, they find out. Yeah, because I told my manager at Bayern, I said, well, I have, at the time I did an apprenticeship, I worked for a company, and I said to him, I have to go to another city in Germany to work for a week away from Munich, so I can't come to training. And said I flew to Birmingham, and after three days, Aston Villa, they, they needed permission for me to play in a practice match. Okay. And obviously they sent a fax to, to Bayern Super Munich. Brand. And I said, well, uh, your player's here. And he said, no, no, he told us he's somewhere else. And obviously, uh, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge and Uli Hoeneß, they asked me to go back immediately. I mean, these are the big, big guns. Yeah, and, and suddenly I felt like, yeah, they know I'm, I'm there. I'm still there. Mm. <laughs> and uh, yeah. But the risk is looking maybe not like a win just at that moment when it's Hoeneß and Rummenigge. Of course. And then I had to tell my parents and I had yeah. to tell my manager at the club. And of course, I had to go back. But I stayed until the end of the week and um, went back with a contract in my pocket. And then I went to see Bayern and said, listen, I felt, you know, if I told you the truth, you wouldn't have let me go. Yeah. So 
and that's why I did it. And in the end, it turned out to be the best, almost, yeah, the best decision of my life. Oh, look, you're talking to somebody who, who, who got in awful trouble with his family for nicking off to the World Cup in 1982, having never been abroad before and got to live in Spain. So you're ringing all the bells that you need yeah. to ring with me. I'm like, yeah, go on, take that risk. But I'm still interested because in this story, I don't know who the agent is, so you can name or not name them. But in this story, if you tell that story a hundred times, mm -hmm. about an agent handing out cards, whether it's to an actor or a footballer, or whatever, the trial isn't there. And, yeah. and it, it's a con. And you turn up in Birmingham, people say, who are you and what the hell are you doing here? Yeah. Which is a thought that must have flitted across your mind as you're, I don't know, car, boat, train. Yeah. How the hell did you get there? Well, the agent helped me. I mean, he was based in Australia and he's still there. You know, he's a Scottish fella. And I said, <laughs> well, <laughs> and I'm, I'm so grateful to this man because uh, he made he made it possible for me to, yeah. to get this trial. And of course, afterwards, he tried to sign me up and said, you know, I'm, I'm ever so grateful for what you've done for me, but you are based in Australia. How can you be my agent here in Europe? But I, uh, I'm i still in touch with him, even though he's never been my agent, but he's, he's made sure I can get this trial at Villa. And that's how my career started, and, and that was fantastic. And I didn't think of the, uh, the risk. I say I took a risk, but I thought, let's just do it and see what happens. And fantastic. that's, and you think, yeah, that's, that's good. He's often we I was so, you know, controlled about my actions, and and this time I thought, yeah. okay, let's <laughs> just do it, see what happens, and uh, and again, it just that's how my career started. It's like everything in life. A little bit of equilibrium where the cocktail is control and planning and structure and risk. Yeah. If you can bring the cocktail together, then things are going to happen explosively. Yeah. Who greets you? Who, who who stands out in this mythical yellow brick road trip to Birmingham? Aged eighteen. 18, uh, 17, uh, 17 I was at the time, yeah, I mean, uh, through the agent, the, the flight was booked by the club, and I arrived at Birmingham Airport, and somebody from the club, Acad academy it. director, picked me up and said, you know, welcome to Birmingham, and they couldn't believe that a 17-year-old Bayern Munich player is not under contract and can actually make the trip to Birmingham yeah. and, and train with them. Yeah. Uh, because they asked me on the second day, are you, are you serious? You don't have a contract with Bayern Munich? I said, no. And that was part of the reason, of course, I've, I felt I can do this because yeah. I'm not, you know, with Bayern. I mean, I've been there for 10 years, but I've never signed a, a contract. Yeah. So I'm free to go whenever I want to. Yeah. And they just couldn't believe it. So I trained for a few days and they could immediately spot, like, this guy's good. Why is he here? Because he's, he's pretty good. And um, they tried to convince me after a few days. I said, we want to see, see you in a practice match. That's why they need to get the permission from Bayern. And that's when it all started to become a little bit difficult. So I never played in a practice match. But what they saw in training was enough for them to offer me a contract after five days and said, we want you back. And that was in, in end of January, beginning of February. Then I went to, back to Bayern and had about six months to decide on my future. Bayern offered me a contract. I also had a trial with Liverpool and with Celtic. And then I decided that Aston Villa is a club I want to join because they really made me feel wanted all those months, then I signed for them. The, the light bulbs are exploding in my head at the moment. You've described really articulately, this isn't your phrase, but it was a slightly dog-eat-dog -dog atmosphere in the Bayern Munich training ground in the academy because so few would make it through the bottleneck into the first. It was only a week at first, yeah. but was there a noticeable difference in atmosphere at Aston Villa in the training or the attitude of the way people, or is it identical? Football's always a shark-infested swimming pool. I mean, they were curious at first. Obviously, the players ask themselves, like, so you always have trialists. Some are better than others, but they're, they're new my story. You know, he's, he's a trialist. He's a regular at Bayern under-17 team. Why is he training with us? And, and they could uh, unleash some of the hammer shots in, in, a, in the first <laughs> training session. And, and, and they thought, who's this kid? And, and suddenly, the manager would set up training sessions where we would try to hit the ball as hard as possible. And I, you know, hit players and do free kicks, set pieces, and take shots from everywhere. And they just loved it. You know, the manager really loved it. And I loved it. And the camaraderie was good. And, and training was fun. You know, most of the time, we just warm up, you know, play rondos and, and then play games. When I say rondos, like five against two, and it was fun. And then uh, you do some sprints in between and have seven side games and I thought this is fun you know this is a lot of fun here and they were really encouraging and I liked the atmosphere and it was competitive yes and I could tell the difference between training in, in Germany where everything everyone was nice and you could talk to the train uh, to the manager and there the manager was the boss he was the gaffer and, and the players they would kick other players in training and it's like yeah this is this is good you know you just give and take and I enjoyed it I had a really good time there I, I don't know if you're a man for regrets and you said it's the best thing that happened when the Scott and Australia yeah. and New Zealand sent the Bavarian to Birmingham. So it's really quite a nice little Christopher Columbus thing going on uh -huh. there. But Liverpool, you mentioned Liverpool. It could have been Didier Man and Hammer 
anchoring Steven Liverpool Gerard, to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, these are reasonable. For, uh, yeah, they're, they're not regrets bad, I've had yeah. a few, but then again, too few to mention. What? It's the same as Bayern Munich. You, you think, well, this is a huge club. Uh, what are the chances for me to get into the first team and become a regular? At Liverpool, the chances are very little. Bayern the same. Oh. But Aston Villa is a good Premiership club. And I could tell the way they treated me, the way they spoke about me. And I thought, you know, they're not bullshit to me. They want mm-hmm. me in the first team mm-hmm. as soon as possible. I believe them. And that's why I decided to go there. Like I said, the manager, you can tell that he likes you as a player. He will support you. I couldn't foresee, of course, what it would be like to live in a, in a foreign country, having to learn the language, new culture. But it was an adventure. It was the Premier League. At the time, the Premier League was the best league in, in Europe. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone was talking about it. And I thought, this is a big adventure. At the same time, there was four or five other young Germans who would go to England, which is kind of a, a wave. And, and suddenly, German football, they asked them, so like, why are these you know, young talents leaving the country and, and go to England? What are we doing wrong here? I didn't see it that way. I just saw the opportunity. You know, it wasn't my ambition as a 14, 15-year-old to play in England one day. I wanted to become a Bundesliga player for Bayern Munich, ideally. And suddenly you get the opportunity and you think, yeah, that's a, another chance here to get to the top, so why not take it? Uh, but it was tough uh, at first, I have to tell you. How was your English at first, in that, particularly in that first week of trial? I thought my English was, was decent. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly you go into the dressing room and you have, OK, you have Welsh players, Irish, Northern Irish, Scottish... English, well, not English, Bromley players. And you don't understand a single word. You think, are they talking about me? What are they talking about? And I thought, all those years I learned English at school, out the window, it's just like, it was for nothing. It was pretty intimidating as well. First time in in a a new dressing room, because I've been with Bayern for 11 years. And it's always difficult going in. You don't know a single person. You know, it wasn't like I've played with some of these players before somewhere else. No, I didn't know anyone. And suddenly you go in, don't understand a single word. You're competing with them, and you are not a friend. You're an enemy. You know that's how you see it. That's how they see you. Yeah. That was a new experience, and it certainly shaped me. You're obviously someone who assesses a lot. Clearly, got a very strategic, analytical yeah. brain. How the fuck do you analyse anybody if you can't understand what they're saying? <laughs> there, may, there may be foes on the pitch, but there might be a friend over there in the corner with the sort of uh, strange haircut and the green towel, but I can't stand him, so I don't know if he's a friend or a foe. That yeah, it it makes you feel uncomfortable. And the good thing is, well, you just wait for the training to start because no one's talking then, and you can let the football do the talking. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was waiting for. And, you know, the time in the dressing room, you're trying to pick up bits and pieces, but you're not going to succeed. And you think, let just training start. Or you think, oh, I'll go to the gym, do some extra work, because, you know, why am I sitting here with 15 other guys that you can't talk to? They were incredibly nice, you know, people showing you around, get to know the club, because I could have possibly signed for them, which I did, of course. So they treated me nicely on the one hand, but at the same time, it's like, OK, I, I, I want to convince them and I want to play football. Let's just start with training and stop the talking here. And that's why being there and not understanding anything made me feel uncomfortable at first. But then when, as soon as training started, it's like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I've got two little images in my head here. One is um, the man who crashed in a light airplane and walked away from it, Lily Honus. Mm-hmm. Now I'm guessing here, possibly being the more understanding of the two when they bring you back to say, where the fuck have you been and you told us lies? Whereas Rumenegger, for all his bonhomie, and that is a, I think a pretty tough, ruthless kind of guy. How were you treated in that meeting? It was only Uli Hoeneß I, I talked to. Karl-Heinz Rumenegger wasn't there. My dad was present and my manager. Well, Uli Hoeneß, you know, he just he asked me the question, why did you not tell us? Why did you go there? He, he told me that I'm one of five or six really good young players that they want to promote into the reserves and then eventually to the first team. And he said, you know, if if you want to sign for a big club like Manchester United or Real Madrid, I'd understand. But, you know, you want to go to Aston Villa. Why? You know, we are Bayern Munich and we want to help you in your career. That's what he said. Having been at the club for for 10 years, I thought, it's the first time I'm talking to him and he's telling me I'm a good player. Do I really believe him? I mean, I admire him for what he's done for the club. He's, He's done so much great stuff for the club. But there, it's me sitting there and he's telling me that I've done something wrong. Yes, I've done something wrong. I, I could have told him. I still think that was the best way for me to get what I wanted. And yeah, I was just like, yeah, I was looking around in his office. He's got a huge office. First time you're talking to the boss of Bayern Munich. It was pretty impressive. My dad sat there and afterwards he told me, you know, he was right and, you know, you should listen to Ole Hoeneß. I was like, Dad, you, I thought you support my career and, and not Bayern Munich and Ole Hoeneß. That's why I had an argument with my dad afterwards and he was really impressed like I was. 
I tried to stay calm and I, I did stay calm because I was really impressed to finally get to speak to the man himself, Oli Hernes. Um, but I always believed I've done the right thing. You know, I want to become a football player and if it's not a Bayern Munich, it's going to be somewhere else. And he tried to convince me it didn't work, so I left. We're seekers of the truth here, as you can mm -hmm. plainly yeah. see in the beginning of you. But this is the slot where you can romanticise or even lie if you want. Because I have an image in my head that your dad finds out who you're going to sign for and he says... Ah, yeah, I remember the European Cup final when Aston Villa beat 1860's biggest enemies and he said, my son, I've never been prouder <laughs> of you. Because football's full of revenge fantasies. So it is. Give me that one, even yeah. if he didn't say it, please. Yeah, no, no, he, he never said that. I, I don't know whether he even knew because I only found out when I signed for Villa, they said, oh, Bayern Munich, you know, we beat them in 82. And I didn't know because obviously at Bayern, they never told me about the history. <laughs> <laughs> the, year so the, the first, time, biggest name, the yeah. first time I heard that Bayern Munich lost a final in the European Cup was when I signed for Villa. And my dad never mentioned that. My, my dad always talked about the 1966 team of 1860 when they won the Bundesliga and all the great players, Brunnenmeier and Radenkovic and all of those guys. Uh, that's what he talked about. But because I've been with Bayern for so long, he eventually got to know that Bayern's a really good club and, and they made me a better player. So he was uh, also pragmatic in a way. You know, he wasn't a diehard 1860 fan that would go there every home game and watch them. So he wanted his son to be uh, a good football player and he realised Bayern Munich, they made me a better football player. And that's why in the end he, he turned around and said, oh, Ole Hoeneß, you know, whatever he said, it, it made sense. And, and he said, why do you want to go to England? You know, they always kick long balls and they kick mm. each other. Mm. You know, it's not attractive to watch. And I said, well, Dad, you know, maybe it was in the 80s, uh, 70s, 80s. But it has changed. The Premier League is a really good league, and I can be part of it. Villa really matters to us, and, and we'll touch on them again. But um, I want to go back to angel singing. Maybe the loudest the angels ever sang was against Energy, Energy Corpus. Which, if you're tired of talking that, about that goal, then that's fine. We, we can leave it. But <laughs> that's the last time I talk about it one of the, <laughs> on your podcast. <laughs> you liar. <laughs> one of the guests we had previously on here was Gaisca Mendieta. Who, who scored his two greatest goals, one of which resembles yours against Cobus at the Camp Nou, straight from a corner, left volley top corner. Mm -hmm. And the other was in a cup final where he jiggles the ball over his head, swivels, volleys at home to beat Atletico Madrid. Last game of the season, Stuttgart have never won a title. You've been a key player for Stuttgart all season. You're 1-0 down. Schalke are winning elsewhere. Schalke, famous title bottlers uh -huh. in the Bundesliga. Can you take up the story? Please? Yeah, it probably starts the day before when, you know, for the first time we went to the top after match day 33, we went to the top and suddenly we had to defend that, you know, position to win the Bundesliga because up until then, you know, it was always Schalke, Bayern and uh, maybe Werder Bremen, they were there at the top as well. And, and then suddenly we popped up and um, had to defend that and it's like... Up until then, we were all buzzing, you know, we enjoyed going to training. Players would even come like an hour and a half before training, go out like 50 minutes, before, an hour before training and, and play and, and really having fun. And we would go out together in the afternoons and just chat and, and enjoying ourselves. And suddenly, that last week, everyone got nervous. You know, mm. it's like, oh shit, we can bottle this. And what if we now don't win the league? We, we've lost everything. Uh, so I was so nervous. And the run up to the game on, a, on the Friday, just the day before the game, nobody would speak in training. It's like, this is really bizarre. So you could feel the tension going to the ground, like the fans were there waiting for us. It was just unbelievable. It was a hot day, probably one of the hottest days. You know, everything's to an extreme now. And then we go one nil down to a team that's already relegated. And you think, what is happening here? You know, the stadium goes quiet, you know, there's this really strange atmosphere. And up until the corner comes in, I stand in the right position. And before I scored this goal, it was almost identical situation. Pavel Pardo puts a cross in and I have a shot and it gets blocked. And I thought the likelihood that this happens again is like, it's, it's almost impossible. It is impossible. And what happens, the, the Coppers defence do the same again. They let me stand there about 20 yards from goal. Nobody marks me ball comes in I just hit it perfectly I've never done this in training before and suddenly on that day it goes in and you think like I couldn't even dream this uh, and it happens and just the emotions that go through your body of course now I get goosebumps but, um, it's just so incredible you know your family is there they're like probably the greatest day in your career uh, when I, yeah in your, in your career they're there they're witnessing it you don't know what to do and then suddenly I have to celebrate. I've never really practiced to celebrate. I almost fell over because I kicked the corner flag and you think this is embarrassing. 
and you know so many things go through your mind and, and you just like, from that moment of course I felt like this is our day this is my day this is our day and it can't go wrong and, and I just felt I had a really good game and, and then of course um, when we scored the second goal you just wait for the final whistle and you think everything goes, you know, goes through your mind the celebrations and this is what an achievement you know you win the Bundesliga and you don't win it for Bayern Munich you win it for another team Stuttgart it's been tough in the run up to it the season before I almost left the club because they didn't seem to want to hold on to me. Now, is that with Trap or with V? Because I'm in V as your manager who, who, who helps you or guides you or you guide him, possibly, to the title. But, but what's the relationship? That previous season when things aren't quite right, is that Trap? Uh, it was with Trap the first season. And with him, you know, I was in and out of the team. It was my first season in Germany in the Bundesliga after five years with Villa in the Premier League. And it took me time to adjust, you know, to German football, which sounds weird, but that's the case. I haven't played in the Premier League for five years. And then you have an it- Italian manager, and not just mm-hmm. a Ita- or an Italian mm-hmm. manager, it's, it's Trapp. Giovanni Trapattoni is a legend, mm-hmm. and you have to deal with him, and the club didn't really know how to deal with him. The fans didn't like his style of play, and eventually they sacked him. And I thought, you know, he's a great manager. Um, his ideas didn't quite work out at the club. And then Armin Fee came in. Uh, in the last third of the season and he didn't really like what he saw from me and I was kind of in and out of the team and towards the end of the season he was unhappy with the entire team and I was one of those players Yeah, he was pretty uncomplimentary, wasn't he? He was, Must yeah Must I use the word? Allegedly, he said something about an ox Oh, did he? Which is maybe how he pronounces hammer I, I don't know, it may just have been a mispronunciation I, I don't know <laughs> He had a racehorse and he Well, was he an odd, grumpy man? He, he had really no pedigree he didn't have pedigree. No, that's oh. true. He, he it was his big opportunity in the Bundesliga to you know be in charge with a big club, and he could have some success there. And what he saw that he didn't like, so he thought in the summer he's going to get rid of some players, bring in his own players that he wants that he thinks can bring him success. But what happened with me is I was part of the World Cup squad that summer, and when I came back, I, I played well for the national team again. So he probably felt, well, I can't really leave him out there, but he's not my favourite player. So I ended up staying there and I told him, listen, I'm not a left back because he, in the first game of the new season, he played me as a left back. We mm-hmm. lost 3 0 to Nuremberg mm-hmm. and I was just responsible for all three goals, more or less. Okay, okay I, I had a shocking game, mm-hmm. a really shocking game. And the next game, he, I wasn't even in the squad. You lose 3 2 the next game as well, yeah. so it's a bad start. To the so um, he left me out of the squad and I said to him, Listen, something's got to change. That was still before the transfer window closed. And, and I said, Listen, we've got a problem here because, oh, really? you know, in the preseason, I did well. You played me as a left back. I was clearly not my position. I played badly. And he said, Well, you have to wait now. And I, I just felt, Oh, it's time for us to go, you know, separate ways. I couldn't find a club, so I had to stay. And then I talked to him, I said, listen, now I'm here. Uh, if you want to make use of me, you've got to do it in midfield. And he said, you've got to be patient. I've got 25 players, they all want to play, so take your time. And it took a few weeks until he threw me in, uh, gave me you know, a few chances, and I played well. And from that on, I just became a regular in the team, and everything went ever so well. Because in my eyes, you're still on the sidelines mm-hmm. when you, be, you play Bayern away. I missed that. But by the second half of the season, you play Bayern at home in the Mercedes Stadium and you beat yeah. them 2-0. Yeah. And I think before we talk a little bit about the details of that relationship with, with Vey and how it changed, we, we've skipped to 2007. It's, it's worth putting in context that, for example, in a recent interview we did for the big interview, it was with Luca Vialli, as you know, mm. and we were obsessed by Samp and their title triumph, how extraordinary it was, how thrilling it was, and how it chimed with uh, people of our generation. I'm older than Neil and Martin, but we start to see Italian football for the first time on Channel 4. Mm. So it was that perfect confluence of Serie A's most powerful, exciting time and on our screens, and Samp's victory was unbelievable. We're, we're in a couple of months beyond uh, Leicester having done what people are describing as the most extraordinary feat in, in British football yeah. ever, whether it is or isn't, we can come back to. But still got measures in that, that trio, doesn't it, of Leicester-Sampdoria, because... Yeah, it's not their territory to win Bundesliga. And no, is it's it? not. I mean, what worked in our favour is that we didn't play in a Europa competition, uh, not Champions League, not UEFA Cup as it was called back then. So we had uh, all the time in the world to train, to to do what the manager wanted, and we did it well. But of course, nobody expected us to be up there, and it kind of created momentum. I mean, like I said, the the spirit in the team was 
excellent players just played at the best too many players played at the best in that season that's why we got there and at some point in the season of course it was just like I described earlier everybody loved going to training people saying okay what we're going to do you know after training let's go out and have some coffee together and chat so this was a group of, of players that had so much fun that on the pitch you could just see that we get on really well with each other. And uh, informed players like Murray Gomez, I mean, he was he was on fire. Semi Kadira, I played with him uh, in midfield. They were all good players, but I think some of those other players were just probably better than they should have been. And, uh, and it all came together. And it was, I don't know when it started, but like I said, at some point we realised this. Even, you know, we weren't one nil down. And I never had the feeling we're going to lose this game. You know, have that belief that you go one nil down you always come back and that's what happened and it's kind of probably the last game that went like this was obviously the, the Cottbus game but the one before against Bochum it was symptomatic you know we went one nil down came back I scored the equaliser Gomez scored the 2-1 I mean it was just unbelievable do you think some of the title triumph was to do with the go-karting or the Swiss watchmaking? That was something else. That was a national team. Oh, was that was really? a national team, yeah, yeah. That wasn't the club. Yeah. When was this? What era was this? That was the 2006 World Cup preparation so for it. So you were yeah. building up. That was the sixth yeah. World Cup where you it end was. up finishing third yeah. under Klinsmann and Yogi yeah. Lowe. Mm-hmm. And I'd heard that word. Because it seems... It didn't seem a very Trapatoni thing to me. Uh-huh, no. It didn't seem a very Armin Vey thing. No, no. But even the way I'm saying that makes it sound normal that some other coach might decide to take his players on a Swiss watchmaking course. <laughs> yeah, well, it was uh, no, it was uh, part of the preparation for the World Cup 2006, and it has to be said, IWC, the watchmaker, they kind of have a, a close relationship with the national team. Not a proper sponsorship, but there is a connection there, and that's why they offered a, a watchmaking course. And we were in Geneva, I think, at the time. So I kind of all came together. And it's, it's, a, it's a nice thing to do, you know, not your regular hobby that you have. So just something different. And I think that's really good with the national team. We might touch on it a little bit later. Uh, Oliver Bierhoff in particular, he tries to encourage the players to get out of their comfort zone, to become well-educated in terms of like reading books and, and think about you as, as, as a, have a, personality not just you're not just a footballer you know you, there's more to you than just football and he encourages that so much that you know maybe you have a watchmaking course and one of those players might be thinking oh this is really interesting you know after my career I go into detail I do more of it don't know if anybody does but it was interesting so it was a, it, something of an intellectual exercise rather than a team building exercise well you sit there by yourself and an instructor so you don't talk to your team yeah. it's, it's just something different that you can talk about afterwards you know you have lunch together you think like how did you do did you enjoy that it's like oh no I just asked him how much the, the latest IWC watch is and then, whether I get a discount <laughs> it doesn't really matter you have something different to talk about and not just again like PlayStation or uh, the same magazines that everybody reads or just something you've watched on television it's just something different and, and it makes you think hopefully about yourself about your career after your career it's just little things engages a different part of your brain doesn't it it stops you getting bored. You'd hope so. Okay. You'd hope so. In some cases. Yes. And the German national team is, I, I guess that's why everybody loves going there. Um, because the, the environment there is just so good. And, you know, they, they always make sure the players enjoy themselves. They ask the players what they want. The players get what they want. And the players pay back with Give good performances. Give an example. But I, don't, I don't mean anything secret or controversial. But people that listen to this don't have that access and we're fascinated by it because we're left with imagination. Mm. What's it like in a training camp? Or what's it like when a manager says, I'll tell you what boys, we're gonna, I'll give you an example. Uh, Klopp once told us in a press conference about <laughs> how he decided to take his group of players to a, a sort of Nordic island so they could cook the fish that they caught and all that, whatever. And he said it was an absolute disaster because there were, I don't know what you call midges in Europe, but like mosquitoes or uh-huh. the version of, they all got bitten. They, people got sick because they didn't cook the fish properly. And on the face of it, it was a total disaster. And we were with Eddie Howe recently, the Bournemouth mm-hmm. manager. We told him that and asked him about his decision to take, when he was at Burnley, his players to, to what do you call it, sheep, sheepdog trials. And the, the, uh-huh. actually the players hated it. So gradually, eight, six or seven of them who didn't want to be dropped got into it. Four or five of them just went, mm, I'm doing that. And he still went, so I didn't, I immediately saw that they weren't part of the group. And the sheepdog trials obviously didn't go well with British footballers. They didn't like that. <laughs> so what are the equivalents that, that, that Beerhoff or the national team coach says, what do you want to do, lads? And the lads say, this is what we want to do. 
I think they know the, the players pretty well and their preferences. And again, as I said, they ask the players what do they want. And, and especially when you get together for European Championships or the World Cup, uh, you make sure the team hotel is exactly to like and all the players. It's got to have other requirements. Obviously, the, the training pitch has got to be close and the airport if you have to fly out. But in general, it's creating that environment that the players and the core of the group has been there for many years, so you kind of know your players. Okay, some of the guys love playing PlayStation, so make sure there's enough PlayStation yeah. there and big screens. Have areas where players can get together, you know, have a drink, uh, talk, chat. Other players enjoy play backgammon, darts. Table tennis. Table tennis turned out to be pretty popular. And again, it's having spots where players get together, do something else than they normally do, and it gives them a reason to talk to each other. Not only, okay, you're in your room, uh, you have to meet one o'clock for lunch, then you talk for half an hour, most people are on the phone anyway, then they go back to the room, do whatever they want to do, then you have training at four o'clock in the afternoon, go back, shower, and then meet again for, for dinner. So breaking up those things and creating oases for, for players where they meet, chat, and also engage with, with the staff uh, and have a group of 50, 60, 70 people in a hotel where they think, oh, we love this here. Yeah. You know, we, want, we could even stay for another month or so. And that's what they did in, in Brazil, for example. You know, Campo Bahia was quite controversial in the run-up to it because it cost a lot of money. But you know, that's how the spirit evolved. And, and the player said, oh, this is so much fun. We're so far away from home. But this is you know, it's brilliant. And then they go back to the camp. They play football, whatnot. And it's just fun from start to finish. Because your big, big enemy is boredom. It is indeed. Yeah, it is. Which and creates... I think nowadays you can't leave the players alone. Very few can, actually. They know what to do with their f- spare time. But a lot of players, you have to get them involved. You have to ask them, yes, okay, what do you want to do? Bring them together. As you said, boredom is, is, is a big problem. So when they're at home, they know exactly what they want to do when they have time. They have their routine, you know, daily training. Then they go home and meet their friends. But when they're with a the national team, they don't have their friends around them. So you have to make sure there isn't a lot of boredom. And that's what the national team does really well. There you go. The Big Interview is produced by Backpage and by me, Graham Hunter. Thanks as always to Beer Jacket for the music. Please don't only keep up to date with everything that we're doing at grahamhunter.tv. But sign up. It's free. There's a little box for your email address and it means that you won't miss an episode. Never mind all the podcast apps that you've got. I'm undercast, overcast, wombling free, whatever it might be. Sign up with us and we send you the podcast every time it comes out. And we tell you about little pieces of news and we allow you to get your questions to us for the guests as we announce them. There's a newsletter. It'll keep you informed with everything that the Big Interview is doing. We're on Facebook. Look for The Big Interview. We're at GH Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Please keep in touch. Let us know what you think. We do this for you, not just for ourselves, although, damn it, we do enjoy it. Part two of my conversation with the hits will be along on Saturday. Thanks for being there. Bye.